Welcome to Stories of Impact. I'm writer-producer Tavia Gilbert, and every first and third Tuesday, journalist Richard Sergey and I bring you conversations about the art and science of human flourishing. Today is our 20th and final episode of the Luminaries of Human Flourishing season on the Stories of Impact podcast. All season, we've been in conversation with artists, politicians, technologists, environmentalists, doctors, faith leaders, educators, sociologists, and other luminaries. And today, we circle back to the beginning in conversation with president of Templeton World Charity Foundation, biomedical scientist Andrew Sarazen, whose focus on human flourishing opened the door for us to create this special series. We're going to take a summer break before we return in the fall with a new year of programming. But before we leave this season, we wanted Dr. Sarazen to share more about the genesis of TWCF's Human Flourishing Initiative and where the foundation is heading next. Here's our friend, Dr. Andrew Sarazen. The genesis of our focus on human flourishing comes out of two different places. The first is our understanding of the intent of our founder, Sir John Templeton. And one of his quotes that is a favorite of mine is that now is the blossoming time in the creation of man. And Sir John had this big sense of progress and human development that over the long sweep, of course, in any given time, we face our challenges and, and problems. And Sir John was a man who lived in 95, died in 2008, and saw great devastation of the Great Depression, World War II, inflation, and never really lost faith in the human spirit. And so there is this sense that humanity over the long sweep of history grows and develops fundamentally new capabilities and new possibilities. The other has to do, I think, with a response to really what has been a once-in-a-century pandemic that's caused us to ask big questions, the big questions of what makes life worth living? What will I sacrifice for? How will I prioritize my own needs against the needs of others? How will I help those around me? And in short, really, what do I need to flourish rather than just survive? And so really those two things, this broad interest in the long sweep of history and really the concern for the deepest mysteries and possibilities of human existence, at the same time responding to a very acute challenge that we have dealing with a once in a century pandemic. And I'll note the foundation is based in the Bahamas. And so in 2019, we had a category five hurricane, which was a once in a century hurricane that came and devastated part of this country, followed by a once in a century pandemic, followed by a once in many decade war in Europe. And so we seem to be having these crises compounding each other in a short space of time. And so there is a recognition that the way we've thought about the world and thought about generating solutions to problems in the past is no longer working. Our focus on flourishing really is about that process of growth and change and resilience and meeting the challenges of our time in a way that keeps us fully alive and fully human. And so the way we think about flourishing is, is definitely about the use of our faculties and our own inbuilt capacities, but also a concern for the ultimate, concern for the long term, concern for that which is not easy or instantaneous. So that's one space of our interest in human flourishing, as contrasted by simply a focus on our own survival, our own physiological needs. But we all know that human existence is so much more than that. How does this recognition align with the missions and goals of Templeton World Charity Foundation? This approach and focus on human flourishing, we think, has at least three components. Uh, one component is on discovery, and that is new ideas, research breakthroughs, results that can be shared broadly. Secondly, we do focus on the development of new innovations, and so that's user testing, that's design of new products and services that have a public benefit, that is translating science into policy briefs and other kinds of resources, it's creating curricula in schools, it's providing 
new source material for religious leaders to work with their congregations. And so it's all of the things that go into making research applicable and approachable for as many people as we can. And so that's the development of specific innovations. And then lastly, we have an area called launch. And that is to take both those practices and that body of knowledge and recruit other funders, communicators, and policymakers around specific issues to translate, again, those research breakthroughs and practices into impact on individual lives. What's included in TWCF's broad focus, and what isn't? One way to describe what we do is a real focus on the interior life. And so what is inside of us in terms of specific habits or practices or behaviors that really are in the control of our own lives. And so we focus on things like listening and learning, focusing on things like forgiveness or gratitude, things like agency the extension of those interior traits, habits, behaviors towards social goals. And so we're not about top-down regulatory change or mandated targets outside of individuals. I think we're very much at trying to give people and provide people with the skills, the attributes, the capacities that they need to flourish. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is change individuals' hearts and minds so that then they can go on to meet the challenges of the day. A good example of that that I've written about is the role that gratitude, especially towards nature, can play in combating the changes in climate that we will face. And so, you know, in, in good experimental psychological work, researchers have shown that gratitude interventions decrease the consumption of resources from a common pool. And so that's just an example of the kind of sort of individual hearts and minds approach that we take that is central to flourishing. Ultimately, it's also going to be helpful for many other things as well. And the idea is that humans can solve almost any problem that they're confronted with by strengthening their own capacities and virtues. Has TWCF defined what human flourishing is? So we've been thinking about this for for quite a while. And, you know, scholars, since human beings developed language, have been grappling with this question of what constitutes the good life and how to live it. And so I don't think that we're the first ones, you know, to consider the question. We know some of the elements, I think, some fundamentals. We don't know how that's borne out over the globe and in different cultures expressed. But we do know that there are certain inbuilt strengths that we have that allow people to pursue whatever ends they choose to pursue. And so for us, human flourishing or the pathways to human flourishing starts with self-determination and agency. It starts with character strengths like humility and open-mindedness and gratitude and forgiveness. It also consists of finding meaning and purpose in one's life. And that is scaffolded by strong social relationships. So I don't think there's ever going to be a last word on what is or is not human flourishing. But I think there are some fundamentals about human existence that we are willing to stake a claim on as being really important. That's character and virtue, close social relationships, meaning and purpose, and self-determination and agency. And, of course, threats to that include things like poor mental and physical health, poverty, changes in the environment. You know, so there are threats to those things. But I think our bet is that by taking an approach that focuses on positive reinforcement of those characteristics, that you know, more often than not, if we can find those embedded within society and strengthened and, and scaffolded by the institutions that shape and transmit our culture— that those things will grow. And again, we will be able to solve problems in new and better ways. Some of those institutions include schools being designed in a way that trains and and equips students with the kinds of skills they need to survive a world where application of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies is incredibly powerful and, and rampant. And so the kinds of skills that need to be taught in schools need to change, or whether that's in religious institutions where access to all kinds of different 
sorts of content related to wisdom and purpose and meaning. We're seeing massive changes in, in religious institutions and higher education and in nation states. All of these institutions are not really doing very well right now. And so we asked the question, is there a different way of solving these tremendous problems? And the only place I think we can start is with ourselves. Does Dr. Sarazin want to answer these questions as a means of understanding people around the world rather than just people in Western societies? Absolutely. We think that one of our long-term goals is to understand the commonality of our human experience and that is utilized and shaped in terms of different cultures, different environments, different challenges, different histories. And so we are very cognizant of the fact that no one has a monopoly on human experience. And moreover, if you look at the research that's been done in human behavior, psychology, sociology, anthropology, that the vast majority of those researchers have drawn subjects and been themselves from a very small fraction of our species. And so we're extremely excited about approaching this issue of flourishing from the context of places and and people around the world that have been marginalized and distanced and really not involved in this great kind of conversation of ideas. And so, you know, how we can think about in the case of some place like Uganda or in Colombia or Sri Lanka, the localized understanding of human flourishing, which, you know, has millennia of history there, can give rise to very important concepts, very important learnings, you know, that can have global relevance and vice versa. So we do see really the opportunity for a global exchange on this topic, because at the end of the day, I think this is actually what most people care about. Yes, we want to reduce poverty and sickness through charitable efforts, through technological efforts, but really the sort of the great mystery and wonder of our existence provides for the meaning that we feel. And that's not just due to some, you know, to good health or or due to material gain. I think we all know people who have tremendous resources and yet are miserable. And also conversely, people who live very simple lives, who are imbued with a kind of spiritual sense of peace and of joy and ultimately purpose. Dr. Sarazen is a data guy. He's a hard scientist. How does that fit into TWCF's journey to explore and understand flourishing? When I consider the kinds of challenges, really the grand challenges that we have in promoting human flourishing, we have a data gap. We just don't simply measure it. These different dimensions of flourishing, we don't measure them in enough subjects, in enough places, and we don't get that data in real time so it can be analyzed by the maximum number of people. So certainly we have a data gap. And then lastly, I think we have a conceptual gap as well. And so again, many of the models that we have for well-being really come from Western ideas. So either Greek and Roman or more recent physiological models. And so I think we need to expand the kinds of conceptual space that we target in order to really truly make progress. A great example of that is According to many Western observers, part of flourishing is sort of requires an absence of disease or requires a certain income level. And I think although that's partially true, I think there's a lot we can learn from flourishing from individuals who are living in conditions of adversity or conditions of uncertainty. Because, you know, if anything is going to characterize the next hundred years, I'm certain that uncertainty will be part of the kind of daily existence of people for better or worse. Some program areas are near and dear to Dr. Sarazen's heart, like forgiveness. What is the importance of forgiveness to human flourishing? So forgiveness is a process of the head and the heart that involves you know, deciding to focus on a traumatic experience or some kind of harmful or hurtful event that a person has experienced. And it also involves using the emotional faculties of our person and our mind to release the person from the hurt that they've experienced. And so it's uh, multi-stage. I think of it as a kind of psychological alchemy that's maybe unique to humans, uh, although I, you know, evidence for that is lacking at this point. But that kind of psychological alchemy converts a harmful experience into something that is a net positive for a person. So it's a reduction in negative thoughts, feelings, and habits 
simultaneously the increase in positive thoughts, feelings, and habits. And it's really a remarkable, almost miraculous process of transformation. In fact, he says over 50 studies around the world have shown the mental and physical health benefits of engaging in this multi-step process that involves the head and the heart. So the reduction in anxiety, the improvement of cardiovascular measures of health in many, many trials in, in many, many parts of the world. And so it's a set of evidence that, to me, begs application around the world. And so for the past several years, we've been funding a campaign called the Discover Forgiveness Campaign. You can visit it at discoverforgiveness.org. We have over 70 summaries of the top research in this area. We've assembled a very prestigious scientific advisory council. We will be putting new tools for practitioners to use this year, whether you're a mental health therapist or guidance counselor or fifth grade teacher or a rabbi, you can go and navigate to a tool section on discoverforgiveness.org that is tailored to you so you can use this amazing research in your own lives. I think that this idea of forgiveness speaks to the general importance of the kinds of tools we need in the future to encourage flourishing. And these are usually at the intersection of these concepts or these ideals of flourishing, of meaning and purpose and of character and virtue, really at the intersection between those ideals and the actual world. And so forgiveness is sort of this, again, miraculous process of us dealing with an imperfect world, dealing with experiences which are very harmful and traumatic. More and more I think about flourishing in a practical sense, is requiring these kinds of tools that help us live up to our better ideals. And that's why it's really so important, in addition to all of the great science that has been funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation and other Templeton philanthropies in the past. Another program area that is emerging focuses on polarization. How does Dr. Sarazen imagine TWCF will tackle such a difficult global issue? So I think, again, the idea of taking these ideals of different philosophical traditions or scientific traditions and thinking about how it benefits people practically, the case study of polarization is a great one where we need new kinds of skills or strengthening of certain kinds of skills in order to navigate the world today when you know information has never been more accessible. There's a lot of knowledge that we can acquire or content that we can consume, but wisdom is sorely lacking. And so one of the skills that is so important to this and is really at the heart of our focus in combating polarization is the skill of listening. And listening kind of requires attention and presence. It requires empathy. It requires an ability to be objective and and put yourself in the shoes of others if you're to do it well. And it also, it means internalizing a little bit of what the other speaker is saying. And so we often talk about, you know, the right to speech, and that's, of course, very important, but we seldom talk about the obligations that we have for listening. And again, that's a great example of a skill, highly in demand, like forgiveness, but seems to be more necessary than ever in taking these ideals of flourishing and translating them into the real world. So listening and the the practice of listening, the psychology of listening is going to be very, very important. And so we're assembling, you know, some of the world's best thinkers on the topic, linking them to practitioners who are deep students of active listening uh, and other such techniques. Now, I think we also want to focus on, you know, what is this thing called polarization that we're seeing? Is it one thing? Is it many things? I liken you know, polarization is a kind of pathology that is associated with certain kinds of groups. How did those groups become polarized? Are there common features? You know, as a biomedical scientist, I'm always looking for biomarkers that are measurable and repeatably reliable in predicting future behavior. Are there biomarkers of polarization? And can we come up with new technologies to help us diagnose Uh, the kinds and types of polarization that exist and then therefore target specific strategies for resolving that pathology just as how physicians and others who who diagnose cancer and prescribe an appropriate course of treatment. So definitely, you know, polarization is not new, but 
I think the sort of study of how groups become polarized and how we unravel from that polarization is something that is worthy of our attention. We can't help but to think that things like listening will be at the center of that, but of course other things as well. Social media is clearly a relatively new component of polarization, and it's being used in myriad ways politically. How will the Foundation tackle social media, especially when it's the way many around the globe now get their information? You know, the topic of social media and its relationship to science or relationship to fact-based reporting and journalism, is it's clearly multifaceted. So I've seen reports of, at least in, in affluent countries, you know, how social media exacerbates political tensions. You know, but I've also seen reports in other contexts where the story is much different, you know, where, where social media has been used effectively to combat corruption, to mobilize peaceful protests, to focus on human rights. And so I think it's a complex story. It's not, there's not a single dimension to the story of social media and polarization. And I think by having more of a global understanding in different cultures and different settings, how social media can be used for the spread of the truth and how it can be used for mobilization and democracy in positive ways as a sort of solidarity accelerating device is as useful as I think documenting some of the sort of harms that we see certainly in, in more affluent settings. I just on a personal note, I think that you know social media amongst scientists is an s- incredibly powerful tool. Uh, there's a thing called science Twitter and it is amazing. And I don't know, I mean, I know scientists under the age of, say, 40, most of them actually get as much knowledge and as much awareness of what's happening in the scientific literature through their colleagues who are working on Twitter uh, and posting on Twitter as they do of any other means. So it's actually incredibly powerful. You know, as a medium, I think it it has a lot of potential. So I think that's just a long-winded way of saying that I think that it's probably naive to sort of cast all of information technology or all of social media with one kind of color when it comes to polarization or it's a powerful tool for the spread of information. And we've got some really good examples of how that, I think, you know, has been a net positive and and also a number of examples of it being extremely harmful. A fairly new program area for TWCF is exploring our common humanity. What are the plans for that initiative? Exploring our common humanity in diverse contexts is an initiative that we're planning right now. It sort of starts with the premise that what we know from an intellectual point of view of flourishing is limited, um, and it's limited by the data methods and conceptual gaps that I spoke about earlier. And so one of the areas that I'm really excited about is developing a series of centers of excellence or networks of excellence in low- and middle-income countries So maybe one in Latin America, one in Sub-Saharan Africa, and one in Asia that serve as regional centers to take this important work about these dimensions of flourishing and examine them in the context of the realities of local culture. And so, you know, just an example comes from work that that we're supporting actually in Sub-Saharan Africa that in that setting, there's a great power of the local community over individuals' choices and actions. And in particular, there's a great reverence for ancestors in that culture. And I think it's accurate to say that, you know, ancestral spirits or ancestral relationships are amongst the most powerful in any individual's life. That's extremely, I think, challenging and different to hear from the point of view of a, you know, a Western ear But, you know, work that we're funding is, you know, looking at social networks in these settings, but not just considering my family or friends in those social networks or an individual's family or friends in those social networks, but actually mapping the importance of ancestral relationships. And the reason that's that's interesting has to do with a different point of view about what constitutes a close social relationship and its practical impact on things like health-seeking behavior. So again, we're trying to link these sort of internal things, these relationships, these habits of character to things which are measurable in terms of sort of more hard outcomes. And so in in this case, you know, what is the impact of ancestor relationships on health-seeking behavior for things like stroke, for example? And so from 
the point of view of, in this case, a sub-Saharan African Ugandan context, I think most people that lived in that culture would say, yes, absolutely. Like, how could you not consider this as an important driver of human behavior? But I'm almost certain that no one else has considered this really from a a basic psychological perspective, especially as related to things like health-seeking behavior. So exploring our common humanity is really, we want to set up regional centers of excellence to evaluate different histories, different cultural beliefs. Our program to do this, I think, is very important, partially because it gives researchers in those settings a means to set their own agenda. And so we're not going to say, come in and like, the most important thing in your community is you know, new sanitation technology, or the most important thing in your community is agriculture, which those, those very well may be. What we're asking is, what kinds of ideas, cultural practices, you know, worldviews do people in, in this part of the world have? And how can that be accentuated, strengthened, leveraged to achieve you know, any social goal that a community might have? And so I think that's a unique thing that we're going to be targeting. And another thing that's important and why it, I think the world is wide and that, you know, same with Sir John's vision of progress where – he thought you know, most of the world hasn't gone through this transition to secularism where there's a sort of separation between the transcendent and our everyday existence. And so our ability to work with researchers in those countries where that worldview is very much, you know, the transcendent and the divine, um, the religious is very much a part of everyday life gives us a great opportunity to expand upon Sir John's views, which are the same, really. He was convinced that there was kind of imminent ability for us to to tap into our own sense of transcendence and knowledge of the divine. And that's what flourishing meant to him, really, was this sort of concern with the ultimate that, you know, it's not just about the here and now, but about ultimate concerns. Another new topic area, one very close to Sir John Templeton's heart, is the science of spirituality. The science of religious and spiritual exercises, or SOURCE, I think is one of our most amazing programs. And that is because it's taking this concept of innovation and applying it to this great source of cultural traditions and practices and beliefs that is religious life. And not many institutions would be sympathetic to funding these different kinds of religious practices uh, and evaluating them from a scientific point of view, but it seems to me central to our mission as well as uh, Sir John's donor intent for us. So briefly, that initiative is funding the evaluation of dozens of different spiritual practices drawn from many of the world's religious traditions, things including prayer, fasting, Sabbath, the practice of lament or grief that's associated in some Christian traditions, singing movements. Anybody that's been observant in any kind of religious tradition knows inherently that a lot of the experience has to do with not just beliefs, but what you do and how you convene and gather and the shepherding of of human life in all of its different stages. And so these different spiritual practices really are that. And I think what's unique about this program is that I think almost all of them take this view that we can, if you can distill the essence of the practice and reliably transmit it and have that enacted in a research context, that you can evaluate those practices for many, many different kinds of, of benefits, uh, whether those benefits are you know, care for one another, whether those benefits are mental health, whether those benefits are physical health. And um, what's the difference between a religious practice or an equivalent non-religious practice? So for example, we're funding research that is looking at religiously motivated fasting, like Ramadan, and comparing that to an active control group you know, that is just simply dieting, calorie restriction without the kind of religious motivation. And is there a difference? It's not to conclude that, you know, one is superior to the other. It's, I think, is to show the difference you know, and the power of these practices so that people who do believe in them can practice them more fully and, and more powerfully than they uh, otherwise would have. 
What are the lessons learned about human flourishing for the Foundation? And what excites Dr. Sarazen most about the future of the initiative? It's very timely. I think that the upheavals of the past several years show no end in in sight. And I do think it's definitely true that the questions we're interested in have never been more important. The term flourishing seems to be more adopted more widely than ever. The research is fascinating. Um, I have no doubt that it will shed light, amazing, amazing light on human experience going forward. We're seeing some really interesting kind of traction at the sort of highest levels of policy, whether that's you know ministers for planning in Costa Rica or in Rwanda or in international organizations like the OECD. We're still formulating the right questions. I think that it is really the central question. The exciting thing for me is to sort of bring the ideas into practice and into focus in terms of specific platforms, specific technologies, specific you know, resources and policies. I think that's really going to be an interesting space going forward. So not just the sort of papers that are written, but the tools that will be used to deliver those results to people who can use it. So I think we will see new platforms develop, whether that's in social media or technology or even social movements around these concepts. So I think super fascinating growth area. It's going to be translated and be very powerful. The question is how, and the question for the foundation is how do we help that develop in a meaningful way? Before I had the honor of writing and hosting this podcast, flourishing was not in my frequent vocabulary. But for the last two years, it's been a concept that I've thought about daily. And like Dr. Sarazen said, flourishing is a term that seems to be more widely in use than ever before. That's exciting, and it's so hopeful. While there is deep uncertainty and challenge in the world, simultaneously, more people than ever are thinking about, talking about, and working toward the ability of humans to flourish. The stories we've brought you uplift my spirits, make me see the world differently, shine light on human creativity, ingenuity, and resilience. I hope they've done the same for you. And there's more to come. Starting in September, we'll be bringing you a new series of conversations on the art and science of human flourishing, with a focus on polarization, diverse intelligence, character development, freedom and economy, and spirituality. I can't wait to be back with you. If you appreciate the Stories of Impact podcast, please follow us and rate and review us. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and at storiesofimpact.org. This has been the Stories of Impact podcast with Richard Sergey and Tavia Gilbert. Written and produced by TalkBox Productions and Tavia Gilbert. Senior producer Katie Flood. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Mix and master by Kayla L. Rod. Executive producer Michelle Cobb. The Stories of Impact podcast is generously supported by Templeton World Charity Foundation.